afternoon, we have the presence of uh, Dr. Ajit Ranade, who's a senior president and chief economist at Aditya Billa Group. In fact, he's a man with many noteworthy credentials, also being the executive officer of Financial Technologies India Limited, and has also served as a chief economist at ABN Amro Bank, and also serves as a director on board of Hindalco Almex Aerospace Limited, a joint venture company of the Hindalco and Almex uh, Incorporates of USA. So this afternoon, we're about to uh, receive perspectives and insights from the very own Dr. Ajit Ranade. So can we have an enthusiastic round of applause to welcome our speaker, Dr. Ranade. Thank you, Kavya. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, friends. So uh, uh, this is one more day of uh, one more session of uh, discussing the budget. Uh, thank you for inviting me, uh, uh, Vidya, and your colleagues. So uh, I know it's a post-lunch session. Uh, I hope uh, uh, you had some coffee to uh, stimulate, like you, like the budget stimulated us. Uh, now I know that it's been ten days now. Today is what ninth of March. Uh, 10th, sorry. So it's been 10 days since the budget was presented. So what I propose uh, to do is uh, talk about a few things which I found uh, somewhat interesting or uh, good or bad or objectionable or wonderful. So uh, let me make a presentation that way. And maybe uh, with the permission of Vidya, we can have some time for a question and answers uh, discussion. So that way I think uh, we can uh, get it, make it more effective. So uh, let me just quickly begin. You see, the background of the budget is the following: that uh, we have, for the uh, for after a long time, after almost 30 years, we have a government where the major, the main ruling party, has more than 283 uh, members of parliament, right? And the NDA together, I think, has 300 plus members. The way the budget is presented, the, technically, the budget is a proposal. Uh, that is, it's a proposal of spending and how that spending is going to be financed in the next one year. It's a proposal. Not even a single rupee can be spent by the government of India without the consent of parliament. That's the rule. That's the constitutional provision. So therefore, a finance bill has to be tabled and has to be approved by parliament. Then from 1st of April onwards in the next financial year, the government can spend money. Yeah. But this time, Unlike the previous governments, in fact, like I said, first time after a long time of 30 years gap, first time we have had a situation where, in fact, the ruling party has 283 members. So, agar unko chahiye, to they can just present a proposal, a budget plan, and it can get approved just like that. Even if everybody else in parliament uh, decides to oppose it, it will just get passed by majority because that's how the voting happens. And in fact, we have a whip system, right? So uh, surely it's it's a cakewalk. Jobi aap propose ki jay, it'll be passed. And unlike other bills, uh, such as the let's say the GST bill or many other bills, unlike other legislations in Parliament, the finance bill does not ha does not need the blessings or does not need the passage in Rajya Sabha, which is where the ruling party has some difficulty. So uh, the way uh, the constitutional provision is that the budget proposal can perhaps be uh, the Rajya Sabha can perhaps raise some questions, some objections, and some, ask for some reconsiderations. But uh, they can they can send it back to Lok Sabha, you know, and there might be a discussion, perhaps some revision. But Rajya Sabha cannot block the passage of the finance bill. So that is the background. If I say, hey, then why, you know, uh, how come, you know, such a, then there's no problem, just, just, we can go full guns with, with bold things, bold decisions, bold proposals, right? That's, that's not the case. Why? Because even though you have a whip system, even though, you know, the ruling party can just completely, and perhaps that is why, the reason why there's such a lot of expectation that this time the budget is going to be full of fantastic reforms, some radical revolutionary decisions and, and, you know, some, some papers you must have read this. But it's not that. Why? Because after all, the, each member of the ruling party also, member of parliament, is answerable to their own constituency. And so therefore, whatever uh, proposals that come finally in the form of a budget, these proposals represent some kind of a consensus. 
these represent some kind of a consensus and th this has to be a consensus which is acceptable to the voters which is acceptable to taxpayers which is acceptable to citizens of india so even if you have a what they what they call left wing government right wing government centrist government the the fact is that india's uh, policies and you know uh, whether it's budgets or economic policy in general have a tremendous sense of continuity if you look back last 25 years they go they are going in a particular direction maybe sometimes the speed is fast sometimes the speed is slow and by and large it's a it's a it's a direction that has been uh, kept consistent by various governments we have we have had two or three i mean we have had several different governments in the last 25 years so that's one thing i want to say in up front that even though with a absolute majority in in lok sabha you still need uh, to have a budget which has a uh, somewhat which reflects the consensus thinking about the economy and about about economic reforms okay that's one second point is that the backdrop of this uh, budget was the huge there were two big problems in the economy one bigger problem the was the the problems in agriculture and the rural economy the the, the stories of agriculture distress the fact that for two consecutive years we've had a drought situation we've had real wages stagnating in agriculture we've had uh, commodity prices falling you had uh, rural incomes uh, rural purchasing power not doing so well that's a big story that was one big backdrop the other big backdrop was the problems with the banking sector slowly slowly the the, the news of the various npas today is not the time to discuss what kyun hua but the fact is that the npa level is now reached 5.1% and uh, perhaps will go higher and repeatedly the reserve bank of india and various other people have been saying even though the npas are confined to about five six sectors real estate infrastructure and so on steel so that was the other big backdrop so surely the budget there is expectation that it is going to address these two for sure so that's the backdrop okay that number one you need still need to have a consensus reflecting a consensus view secondly uh, uh, the the address the rural situation rural distress thirdly uh, uh, take take cognizance of the banking situation having said that the biggest uh, the biggest uh, of course headline news from the budget was the fact that uh, the the finance minister and the and the budget uh, proposal has kept two fiscal promises two promises have been kept one year ago the finance minister said that during this next year we are going to target a fiscal deficit target uh, we are going to target the fiscal deficit to be 3.9% of gdp guess what at the end of the year we actually he managed to keep that promise second 12 months ago the finance minister said in the subsequent years we are going to target the deficit to come down to 3.5% guess what the second promise also has been kept namely the budget proposal says that for next year that is fiscal year 17 the target is going to be 3.5% so these are two uh, you know two great um, uh, headline sort of uh, achievements that two fiscal promises have been kept this is i think a very big big uh, uh, big message from the budget that the whatever whatever you know uh, whatever the other uh, compulsions we are going to be very much cognizant of the fiscal deficit situation and mind you this was not easy because there was a lot of pressure from various quarters from industry chambers from people in government including the chief economic advisor who were saying are isme kya you know fark padta 3.5% don't be like a fiscal fundamentalist don't be like a fiscal hawk do uh, we this is a year when we need some stimulus we need to expand the fiscal deficit let's go for 3.7% 3.8% to say 0.23 decimal se kya hota hai kind of a thing but actually it was a great i think uh, achievement to stick to that 3.5 number so i i really applaud that and it's just not, not just me uh, you you must have seen in the few days after the budget all three markets went up i don't know what the situation is today Uh, but uh, i think it's positive so the stock market went up the bond market went up the currency market went up Me meaning all of them had a pretty strong bullish reaction and this is unprecedented i don't think it has happened at least in recent times so this uh, i think uh, the reason for this is that perhaps the uh, 
the expectation is, I mean, the reason this, this kind of reaction we saw is that there is a potential virtuous cycle now which can happen, namely that with the fiscal situation now being, uh, fiscal deficit being now targeted uh, to the promised number, this leaves room now for the Reserve Bank, let's say, to have a rate cut or, you know, uh, have an aggressive uh, rate cutting stance, which can in turn um, enthuse investors, especially foreign and domestic investors, and if there is dollar inflow further, that can lead to uh, stabilization or if not strengthening of the rupee, you know, in, uh, exchange rate, which in turn can again, you know, because it will have some moderating influence on inflation, which in turn can again attract more FDI, uh, more uh, foreign inflows, which can become a virtuous cycle. So inflows, uh, currency strengthening, inflation moderation, more inflows, currency, you know, that kind of a thing. So this is, uh, this is a potentially uh, um, virtuous cycle scenario that can happen. And I think we are seeing some of that. Of course, you know, you, this, we should not get carried away. You know, there should be not uh, ex irrational exuberance. In any case, we don't want the rupee to get so strong that we become uncompetitive with our neighbors, especially China. Uh, already the Reserve Bank uh, is telling us that the rupee is somewhat overvalued. Uh, according to their calculations, it is 10% overvalued. I'm not so sure uh, because that RER calculation, there are two, three ways of looking at it. So we don't want the rupee to be too strong because already one, one uh, big point of concern this last one year, even though we had, as I said, fiscal deficit promises were kept, uh, current account deficit came down, inflation was moderating, uh, FII inflows were very good, private uh, FDI inflows were record high, $50 billion almost. Private equity inflows into India were fantastic. First time private equity inflows were more than stock market inflows. All that was good, but as I said, apart from the rural distress and the banking problem that I said, another big area of concern was the fact that our ex exports were not doing well. Exports had contracted by 15% this year, have contracted. And this is again very unusual because India's exports generally have done very well, 10 to 15% growth. Maybe they, have, you know, sometimes if it's a, uh, if it's a difficult year, single digit, but negative 15, that's something to be concerned, even though some of it is because of falling commodity prices. So other exports are suffering, then in such a scenario, we don't want the rupee to get too strong because that, that will affect our exports adversely. So that is the, um, that's the main takeaway, according to me, the fiscal message that uh, incidentally the reason the fiscal message is important, I told you, potentially it can lead to this vir virtuous cycle of inflows, currency, currency strengthening and, uh, and uh, more stock market and FDI inflows. But it's also important because internationally, if you look at India's situation and look at how many large countries have a fiscal deficit, combined fiscal deficit ratio of 7%, which means combined matlab, states plus center. There are only two countries in the world which have this kind of a high deficit, which is India and Brazil. And you know what is happening in Brazil. Brazil is actually, GDP is growing by minus three. I mean, it is shrinking. Brazil and Russia are two large economies. BRIC, remember BRIC? Brazil, Russia, India, China. Usme se Brazil is minus 5%, Russia is minus 3 or 5%. So it's, that is not a good example for us at this point. In fact, there was a speech given by the Reserve Bank Governor in Delhi, uh, I think last month, where he pointed out the dangers of uh, fiscal stimulus because of, look what happened in Brazil. So this fiscal deficit number is important. And, and therefore, this fiscal message that we have given, that we are fiscally disciplined, rahenge, fiscal prudence, fiscal consolidation, we will stick to this path, these are to be welcomed. So now, now we, of course, talk about the rest of the budget story. The, as I was telling you um, um, that this is this, this sort of a parliamentary process that kuch bhi karo, you know, the majority has so we can do a lot of things that doesn't work because you have to respect the consensus um, of the electorate. The other big reason that you, there is limited room for, uh, limited room to do something is, is look at the committed expenses. See this year, the, uh, the finance minister has presented to us a budget which is roughly 20 lakh crores, 20 trillion rupees, which is one-sixth of India's income. One-sixth of India's national income is, uh, is decided by this one speech or one proposal which the minister of the country stands up in parliament 29 February 
and makes a speech at 11 o'clock. One sixth of national. That's the that's the big impact. That's the significance of the speech. But there are a lot of uh, um, lot of expenditures already committed. Commitment. There is no choice, no discretion. Example: uh, interest payment. The single most, the largest, ex single largest uh, expenditure commitment is interest payment. I think I, I forget what the exact number is. About four and a half. Let's say five lakh crores. Between four and a half and five lakh crores. So five lakh crores, which is one fourth of your spending, twenty lakh crores is the total budget. One fourth of that spending is just one single item: interest payment. That interest is paid on this huge mountain of the debt uh, called the sovereign debt, and this interest payment is uh, so. Therefore, when you're when you're deciding the budget for next year, that part is taken away, so you don't have a leeway, no discretion in that part. So you are left with the remaining part. So there are many such items which are non-discretionary. There are many such items which are non-discretionary. Uh, I won't list them here, but you know so all those commitments on various subsidies. These are all commitments. Uh, 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 for example, now the fact is that the uh, seventh pay commission recommendations. Those are also to the extent that the government has accepted them. That also is a commitment now. Uh, the OROP uh, kind of uh, that is another. Then um, I guess you can say the, the the expenditure on defense, which did not figure in the budget speech at all, that's also a commitment. So if you leave, if you look, look at all those uh, parameters, there's not much uh, leeway. I mean, there's so, sorry, I should say there's limited leeway about how much you can play. So um, what were the? So let me just um, um, uh, say what were the other highlights apart from the fiscal uh, great message of fiscal discipline. What were the other highlights? The other highlights, of course, I must say, is that uh, non-budget items. There were a lot of them. I mean, you can. Uh, we are still, as I said, only ten days ago we had the budget speech, but the budget documents are almost like two, three thousand pages. So it takes a lot of time to go through the fine print. But if you look at the non-spending uh, or non-revenue-related uh, decisions announced in the speech or as policy, they're they're all very very welcome, such as the tape, the Aadhaar bill, which happened right away, such as the bankruptcy bill, which is going to be. Uh, uh, table, such as the PPP resolution uh, mechanism through the new commission. So public-private partnership projects, a lot of them have got stuck, mostly because of disputes, because they go to court and they get st stuck there. So instead of instead of in, uh, instead of uh, instead of having uh, fast-track courts or special courts, there's going to be a commission which will look at the possibility of renegotiating some of these contracts. So that also is welcome because uh, if you unlock and uh, unentangle the, the many of these projects, you know the, many of them will will again get started. Then there is a uh, uh, lot of stuff related to tax disputes. So PPP disputes, ek baat hai. Tax disputes. The total amount of money that's locked up in various uh, tax litigation is, I believe, more than four lakh crores. Imagine four lakh crores is stuck in litigation where one party to the litigation is income tax department or tax department. And the other party is uh, the taxpayer. Often it, the taxpayer is also happens to be government of India enterprises. In fact, uh, I believe a very large part of the disputes are between uh, a government department and the tax department. So there is a lot of fine print there about uh, making um, the improving this uh, uh, process of uh, settling the tax disputes or making it easier. So the, I won't go through that uh, small fine print. Uh, I must say also that uh, I, I actually um, I have these numbers which let me just uh, uh, from the budget. Uh, you know this is also a season where in our own companies we are doing uh, you know budgeting for next year. We are looking at what was the performance for last year, and we usually see what last year what was the target set by the company, how much did we achieve or overachieve, underachieve, and what are the targets for next year. So if you apply the same kind of thinking to government of India. Last year, the revenue deficit was targeted at 2.8 percent of GDP. The actual performance came out to be 2.5 percent of GDP. Usse bhi kam aaya, deficit kam aaya. Positive, tick mark. Second, the fiscal deficit, I told you, the target was 3.9 percent of GDP. The actual performance was 3.9 percent of GDP. Achieved, tick mark. Third, the tax revenue, total tax collection, was budgeted to be 
9.2 lakh crores, 9.2 trillion rupees. The actual achievement, actual collection on that uh, tax revenue account was 9.48 lakh crores. Achieved, overachieved, tick mark. Fourth, non-tax revenue was budgeted to be 2.21 lakh crores. Actual non-tax collection during the year was 2.59 lakh crores. Achieved, overachieved, tick mark. Recovery of loans. Government of India was planning to recover, according to the last year's budget, 10.7 thousand crores. Actually recovered 18.9 thousand crores. Overachieved. Tick mark. Interest paid on the debt. Total interest to, that was planned to be paid last year as per the budget plan was 4.56 lakh crores. Actual payment, 4.4 lakh crores. 10,000 crores ka savings achieved, tick mark. So, I mean, this is not this is not the kind of thing we are uh, used to in government performance, right? Usually, the all the numbers, the slippage is in the other direction. You had planned to raise so much of tax revenue, usme kam aya. You had planned to raise so much of non-tax revenue, usme kam aya. You had planned to recover loans of this much, usse kam aya. You had planned to make interest payments of so much, usse jada aya. But, so, I, I mean, I don't want to bore you with too many details, but this actually shows that uh, on these counts also we should be happy about the budget. So, generally, I think um, there's a lot to comment on the budget, but I will now conclude because I don't want to leave you with the impression that everything is all rosy, rosy, hunky-dory. So, what are, my, what are the, some of the things which I was troubled about? So, uh, I was... Uh, three things, um, two or three things. One is this whole uh, business of the Ses Raj. So what I call the tyranny of the Ses Raj. So Seses are, uh, so there are three new Seses which came this year. Uh, one was the Swachh Bharat Ses which came I think in November. Then you have the Krishi Kalyan Ses which was announced in the budget which together effectively makes the service tax rate now at uh, what, 15%? And then there was this coal cess, which was renamed as uh, Swachh Bharat, ne, Swachh uh, Environment Cess, Clean Environment Cess, Clean Energy or Clean Environment Cess. So, um, yes, Cess Raj, jo hai, there's so many cesses, there's an excess of cess, and, and it is, uh, now the situation is that the, of the total tax share of the government of India, so government of India collects all these taxes from everybody, then it splits थोड़ा स्टेट्स को जाता है बाकी स्टेट सेंटर को रहता है तो ये सेंटर का जो कलेक्शन है स्टेट सेंटर uh, का जो टैक्स शेयर है व्हाट परसेंटेज ऑफ दैट कम्स फ्रॉम द फ्रॉम द सेसेस अलोन आंसर 20% 18. समथिंग सो ऑलमोस्ट 20 ऑलमोस्ट 1 फिफ्थ ऑफ योर नाउ शेयर ऑफ टैक्स रेवेन्यूज इज कमिंग फ्रॉम सेस दैट्स नॉट वेरी अनहेल्दी पॉइंट नंबर 1 सेकंड पॉइंट ये जो क्लीन एनर्जी सेस है or, or what, you, what is basically coal says, has been doubled, doubled and doubled three times in the last three years. So it, it started a few years ago, four or five years ago at 50 rupees a ton. First time it was introduced. That 50 became 100, 100 became 200, 200 became 400 rupees this year. It's not ad valorem, it's actually a specific duty. Today the cost of mining coal, open cast mining, is about 300 rupees a ton. Uske upar 400 rupees a ton is now the coal, uh, the whatever, the clean energy says. You know, the, the Prime Minister lady in Australia, Mrs. Julia Gillard, when she introduced a mining uh, tax of $25 a ton, she lost her job. She, she was removed as Prime Minister. Uh, United States of America, the biggest economy in the world, did not sign the Kyoto Protocol for clean environment, I mean, climate change. We are signatories not only to Kyoto Protocol, before that the Montreal Protocol, we are one of the leaders or take a lot of uh, initiative in climate change initiatives. The, the Prime Minister of India in 2008 launched the National Action Plan for Climate Change. We are signatories to Paris recently. So it's not as if we are not aware of this challenge of climate change. But I am I'm, I'm saying why should we be holier than thou? As it is, we have been taken to the WTO and getting punished for our solar solar uh, mission policies by the US. That's a different matter. 
but why are we trying to be holier than thou we we have the th world's third highest coal deposits and in the near foreseeable future our electricity is primarily going to come from coal look at the health of our discoms there are 7 lakh crores which are stuck i mean sorry 7 lakh crores of b either bad loans or uh, overdues you know all so the discoms are struggling they, they are struggling to raise tariffs the electricity prices are going up and here we are putting extra taxes on coal last 8 9 days we have these people who are sitting on strike the jewelry workers jewelry industry because 1% excise has been introduced on and on on jewelry but there is not a murmur of protest i mean nobody's gone on strike because of the coal says there is also a 1% excise on uh, luxury i mean clothing above 1000 rupees if you're buying a shirt or a, a suit which is more than 1000 rupees there is a excise duty new excise duty but that is so i i'm uh, so i said these are the, some of the troubling aspects i feel that the cesses represent indirect taxes indirect tax is a burden which is which affects everybody taxpayers and non taxpayers in the sense that we bolte hain ki only 3% of india's population pays income tax but the fact is that everybody pays taxes because even if you buy a bar of soap or toothpaste usme sales tax rehta hai indirect taxes rehte hain so the actual tax burden falls on most of india and indirect taxes are more regressive because the burden of indirect taxes is disproportionately higher on the poor as compared to non poor so generally the direction of india should be towards more direct taxes and less indirect taxes so all these cesses and all these indirect taxes represent a wrong direction according to me so those are the nitpicking things i can you know i can talk about more but uh, broadly speaking the broad um, very positive message is that uh fiscal discipline fiscal consolidation uh good performance and meeting of targets which were promised last year so adds tremendously to the credibility of the of the government and a lot of reforms in the fine print on on tax litigation on various kind of you know ease of doing business and of course uh, uh sufficient uh, adequate uh, focus on uh, rural economy infrastructure so you know if you give a mic to the economist he can go on and on and so by but to be fair to you i'll conclude here thank you well thank you very much dr ronaldo well uh, ladies and gentlemen the floor is open for question and answer session so please do raise your hands we'll have the uh, mic passed on to you all right so ms sandhya has a question herself so you uh, spoke uh, about the performance initially in the beginning part of your speech and then you spoke about the cess and somewhere when you were talking about some numbers you said that uh, the tax recovery on the tax recovery front the government has delivered rather you know uh, overachieved and then you spoke about the cesses so is that tax recovery real recovery or is it because of the cesses yeah very good question by the way the cess is also a tax huh it's yeah. cess ha huh, so i th thanks for reminding me so what is wrong with the cess first of all the problem is with the cess it's an indirect tax uh, secondly the cess is not shareable with uh, state governments so the cess is in principle against the spirit of cooperative federalism because normally cooperative federalism that prime minister talks a lot about is about sharing of resources the whole gst bill is actually about sharing and a unified tax regime but what cesses tend to do is they go in the opposite direction so actually they are contrary to the spirit of cooperative federalism so you are right that now we, uh, indeed the achievements were there on uh, whatever you said you know revenue deficit the fiscal deficit but how did they achieve that so your question is how did they achieve that one of course the huge benefit that we got from the fall in oil prices because oil prices fell uh, a huge amount of oil subsidy savings was there something like almost 100000 crores not all of it was passed on to the consumers so if oil prices fell by almost 60 to 70% your petrol and diesel prices in the petrol pump did not fall by 60 70% yeah they fell only by 20% to baki ka kahan gaya baki ka was taken up by the government so they used that to shore up their treasury to shore up the fiscal deficit to uh, compensate the oil ma marketing companies or uh, sorry the upstream companies so they, they again and they, by the way they also increased excise on petrol and diesel three almost 300% no murmur came on that so you're right when you start so your point was that while the government has indeed overachieved on all its expenditure targets our recovery targets 
but the the finer point story is that how did they achieve it they achieved it by various means including by introducing cesses or by not passing on the benefits of oil price crash that's true so with every budget pehla ekdam suhavna chamak chamak lagta hai when you start reading 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 then all the ugly part starts becoming visible so that's true some of the details when you go through then you have it becomes uh, you know you can question that <coughs> but as uh, for a discussion like this i think we must appreciate at least the headline uh, impact of the uh, budget and the main initiative the main message that the finance minister is trying to give uh, they're all positive and reformist yeah good afternoon sir Uh, just wanted to know one backdrop that you were uh, talking about initially about the uh, problem that the metal industry specifically metal and mining and power sector is facing but no specific reforms to that especially adding uh, coal uh, clean energy says is a more uh, hit on the power sector per se so i mean no uh, steps taken in that direction or improvement and secondly uh, when we are talking about the headlines of uh, government maintaining this uh, 3.9% uh, deficit but that is at the cost of says uh, the ultimate uh, cost being borne by the consumer itself so to some extent not probably a oh, major so percentage of it yeah so the second part of the question is similar to this lady's question yes. that uh, basically how are we achieving this fiscal consolidation how are we achieving the fiscal targets of course some of it is by introducing new cesses so it's true and cesses tend to be indirect taxes to that extent they are regressive or somewhat unfair in the sense that uh, the burden is shared you know uh, between uh, relatively well off people and low income people so that's true and that's something that's why i caution towards the end of my pre speech i did say that the government should curb its tendency and hopefully will remove these cesses they are saying that once the gst comes all these cesses will go that's the promise or that's what was indicated your first question about what was done for the see the spirit of doing something for this sector that sector this sector i think that has gone now you know those were the long ago in the olden days the budget is to have something specific so for this sector for something for that sector that's it. that approach i think is gone uh, i made the point about the coal says because that affects energy costs of everybody electricity uh, whether it's is metals mining chemicals uh, even textiles all are subject to energy costs and when we make coal expensive we'll be through administered prices international prices of coal are falling and we are putting a cess on it so we are actually making the price of coal in india more expensive than international cost so we are actually introducing kind of an uh, degree of uncompetitiveness so i am cautioning against that sir yeah good afternoon sir uh, whilst uh, we are taking cognizance of the npa uh, some of your views about the the real extent of the npa and uh, the second part of the question is that if we move towards global uh, accounting standard ifrs which is based on expected credit instead of incurred credit loss i think we are sitting sitting on a time bomb on npas yeah, yeah. so npas i told you that of the two serious backdrops uh, to the budget i told you the two big serious macro issues were the rural economy and banking so of course you know the on banking we had uh, indra dhanush we had one gyan sangam one gyan sangam two this year there has been a lot of deliberation uh, mr vinod rai has been appointed as chairman of the banking bureau the ba bank board bureau uh, so there's a lot of thinking going on banking and uh, what is the exact uh, really estimate of npas how serious it is uh, the fact is that under this dispensation both the government and especially the reserve bank of india they are going relentlessly at this problem for last one year more than a year so they have introduced the you know they are they are stressing on the cdr corporate debt restructuring we have the debt re recovery tribunals then you have this sdr the strategic debt uh, you know sdr scheme then you have the 5 by 25 scheme uh, you have so various things are being worked at and the fact is that we are reporting 5.1% i must tell you that in the early 90s 91 92 ke time pehli baar when um, npa recognition was adopted in this country you know that was the first time the npas were some 17 or 18% from those days we have come down to we came actually down to 2 2.5% and now it's gone up again to 5% so it's 5% is pretty serious but let's recognize our own history and our achievements in the last 25 years and just by way of reference the official number for chinese npa is 2% 
Nobody believes in, I mean, not many people believe that number. Ernst and Young has a report that their NPS is 40%, 4-0. So, uh, this is a problem affecting various uh, countries and the fact is as a consequence of SQE and uh, expansion of bank balance sheets, the NPA problem has become uh, serious. In, there was a sovereign debt crisis in Europe, now this is the private debt crisis. I will not call it a crisis but I, I think it is a serious challenge and the sooner we resolve it. So, we also by the way I forgot to mention that uh, we not only had recapitalization of 25,000 crores which is the first installment but we also had the uh, ARC, the bad bank creation of the bad bank. And the sooner we get to IFRS then the, you know this is all about accounting norms. I know a lot of people probably are CAs here. So, the, you have to recognize you can't, kya bolte hai? you can't count your chicken before the egg hatches but the accountant tulte karte hai. So, you, you even after the egg and chicken has come they don't want you to count it. And on the other hand, losses are going to recognize. So, those kind of strict norms we are trying to get there. That's what the spirit of IFRS is. I think it's uh, scheduled for next year or two years from now. For the banking sector, it's still deferred. Deferred, yeah. 2019. Uh, I, I have another part of the question is that, yeah. see, whilst we talk about uh, ease of doing business and startup and make in India and all that, uh, but because of the banking sector problem, many of the eligible, honest, uh, people who deserve to get credit are not getting credit. So, there is something something to think about. Yeah, yeah. so NPA, no, no, exactly. So, NPA problem is not only the problem of recovery, the NPA problem is the problem of t credit delivery to the deserving. Because this problem is locked up here, the legitimate guys are denied credit. Same thing like fiscal deficit. If the biggest borrower in the system is Government of India, they borrow 5 lakh crores every year. So, it's not bada elephant rega, so they just crowd out all the legitimate borrowers. So, when I said fiscal deficit, fiscal uh, responsibility is important, fiscal consolidation, fiscal is important because if they curb their fiscal deficit, then only there's room for others to borrow. Same thing, just like fiscal deficit is a good news. Similarly, doing something about bank NPAs is good news because then it allows the legitimate guys to also become, uh, have access to that credit. Okay, I think, yeah. Any further questions? One last check. Last question. All right, so we'll take one last question from the gentleman. Sir, by recommending the, by, by accepting the recommendation of seven pay commission, what will be the impact of inflation on the economy? And since no tax rate has been changed for individual taxpayers, the persons who are not in government service, they are totally ignored. And by not even providing incentive to go for agriculture business as startups. I believe it's uh, not a fair budget. See, the seventh pay commission uh, allotment, I believe, is something like 0.7 percent of GDP this, in this budget. What it will do is because predominantly these two crore employees tend to be urban based, it's going to add to the urban purchasing uh, power and urban consumption, and therefore, to that extent, the urban economy will benefit. Whether it will lead to inflation, I doubt it because we have been seeing moderation of inflation for the last two or three years. It used to be 10 percent uh, for a long, you know, d between 2009 and 2013. That 10 percent has come down to 5 or 4.5 percent now. And there is a lot of excess capacity in many, you know, many sectors. So, to that extent, while the urban consumption may go up, that will not necessarily contribute to inflation uh, because of the uh, this uh, pay commission. Uh, bonuses or the awards. As far uh, what happens, first of all, because of the pay commission now, even state government employees will, will expect that. So, next year I think we are going to see that. As far what happens to the non-government employees? Well, the whole idea is that the pay commission is a compensation because private sector may, her, uh, you know, at least the organized sector is supposed to get increments and bonuses and variable pay every year and after a gap of 10 years, usually there is, uh, you know, the government servants, they feel they fall behind and the pay commission corrects that gap. So, the spirit of pay commission is to bring them up, but you are saying they are going far ahead. So, maybe, you know, <laughs> over next 10 years, ulta ulta. so I do not know. I mean, you are true, it is true that obviously the pay commission does not apply to non-government employees. All right, thank you again very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ranadi. If I may kindly request you to remain on the stage, I'd like to invite Ms. Sandhya Adhar, who is the Secretary of the Times Conference Limited, to please present a memento as a token of gratitude to Dr. Ranadi. And let's have a round of applause one more time, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, sir. Despite it being a porcelain session, we must admit it was quite an appetizing session indeed. So thank you once again for all those insights. Thank you very much.
and with that 